How not to dislocate your shoulder. Hey interns, I'm Dr. Chris Rayner and I am not your everyday ortho. Today for orthopedic rounds, I'm gonna teach you how not to dislocate your shoulder. If you have not dislocated your shoulder before, then this video is for you. However, if you have dislocated your shoulder and are looking for ways to minimize it from happening again, then this video can definitely help you too. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Let's get to the topic at hand. Number one, what is the labrum? The labrum is a fibrocartilaginous rim that is attached to the edge of the glenoid of the shoulder. It encircles the entire glenoid. It's like a bumper on the edge of the cup of the shoulder. It's kind of like an early warning mechanism. Number two, what does the labrum do? The labrum helps to provide stability to the shoulder joint. It behaves like a speed bump at the edge of the glenoid, and it helps the body to know when the humerus is at risk of dislocating from the shoulder or becoming dissociated from the glenoid. Number three, how do you injure the labrum? The labrum is injured when the shoulder dislocates or subluxates involuntarily. This means that the shoulder comes out of joint partially or fully in a sudden, uncontrolled manner. The labrum is usually torn off the face of the glenoid by the humeral head during the dislocation or subluxation event. Number four, do you need the labrum? Yes, you need the labrum. The labrum functions like an early warning mechanism for the shoulder. Normally, when the shoulder is in a compromised position, the humeral head contacts the glenoid and the brain detects this. If possible, the brain sends signals for corrective actions to be taken before the shoulder comes out of joint. However, if the force applied to the humerus is too great or the speed of movement is too quick, then the body cannot respond quick enough to stop the shoulder from coming out of joint. Without the labrum present, there is not anything to signal the brain that the arm is in a dangerous position and the dislocation may be imminent. By the time the brain becomes aware of the position, the shoulder is already out of joint. Number five, how do you know if you have injured your labrum? Generally speaking, diagnostic imaging is required to confirm injury to the labrum. While x-rays will demonstrate the presence of a dislocation or a subluxation, they cannot directly show injury to the labrum. Injury to the labrum is implied from the dislocation itself. Labral injury is directly imaged using magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. This modality can show bone, cartilage, and soft tissue, so it will reveal the presence of an injury to the labrum. For additional clarity, a magnetic resonance imaging arthrogram, or MRA, can be performed. With this study, the shoulder is injected with radio-opaque contrast agent before the MRI, so that exquisitely fine detail and subtle injuries can be demonstrated. In some cases, if additional bony injury is expected, then computed tomography, or CT scanning, may be used to assess the condition of the glenoid and to determine the presence or absence of an anterior glenoid avulsion fracture otherwise known as a bony bankart lesion. Number six, what are clues that you have injured your labrum? Although you cannot be certain that the labrum is damaged without imaging, there are some signs that may suggest that your labrum has been injured. If your arm comes out of joint frequently, then it is likely that you have injured your labrum. If your shoulder comes out of joint when you reach overhead or when you reach behind yourself, then it is also likely that you have injured your labrum. If your shoulder comes out of a joint with simple movements such as washing your hair, getting dressed, or when sleeping, then it is very likely that you have injured your labrum. Number seven, what should you do if you have suffered a labral injury or you think you have suffered a labral injury? If you think that you have suffered a labral injury, you should seek the assessment of a musculoskeletal specialist who can perform an adequate examination. This may include a sport physiotherapist, an athletic therapist, a rehab physician or physiatrist, a sports medicine physician, or an orthopedic surgeon. They will conduct a thorough history and physical examination that will suggest the presence of a labral injury. Physicians will obtain diagnostic imaging, primarily MRI and possibly CT, to confirm the suspected diagnosis. Number eight, what are the treatment options for a labral tear? The treatment options for recurrent instability of the shoulder include both non-operative and operative options. Effective non-operative options include primarily active progressive physical therapy to restore mobility and supportive strength around the affected shoulder. 
Passive modalities, massage therapy or chiropractic therapy may be utilized to address pain symptoms following dislocation events, but they are not likely to do anything to minimize the likelihood or stop the occurrence of future dislocations. Exercise therapy will increase the strength of supporting musculature and will improve the proprioceptive ability of the brain to minimize the chance of future dislocations. Number nine, what are the different surgical options for a shoulder stabilization? Operative options include a number of different stabilization procedures used to restore stability to the affected shoulder. This includes a shoulder stabilization, a remplissage procedure, a Latterge equivalent procedure, a humeral allograft procedure, a rotational osteotomy of the humerus, or a combination of several of the above procedures. The most common procedure that is effective for most patients is an anterior shoulder stabilization that can be performed as an open or as an arthroscopic keyhole procedure. Number 10, how long should recovery take after shoulder stabilization? Generally speaking, recovery after shoulder stabilization takes between four to six months. Usually there is a period of immobilization immediately after surgery that lasts from three to six weeks where the arm is immobilized in a sling. This period allows the labrum to begin healing to the bone onto where it has been secured. This is followed by a period of physical therapy where first the range of motion of the shoulder is restored before the strength of the arm, shoulder, and the back muscles are developed. This may take another eight to 18 weeks based on your progress through the rehabilitation protocol and the time that it takes to return to your baseline level of function. Number 11, how do you know you are ready to return to activity after a shoulder stabilization? Your ability and readiness to return to activity after shoulder stabilization will be jointly determined by your therapist, your surgeon, and of course yourself, and is usually based on your progress through the rehabilitation protocol. While some specialists will use time from surgery as the primary determinant for assessing readiness to return to activity, there is now evidence that criteria based on range of motion, strength, and proprioceptive function are more appropriate. This just means that your physiotherapist and your surgeon will assess how your operated shoulder functions relative to your uninjured shoulder. If the function is similar to your uninjured shoulder, then you are likely to be cleared for a return to activity. If there is any asymmetry between the two sides, you are likely to require additional rehabilitation before clearance is given. And number 12, what does the future hold if you have injured your shoulder? What are the outcomes after shoulder dislocation? Studies show that young active patients who have suffered a shoulder dislocation are quite likely to suffer additional shoulder dislocation events without a surgical procedure to stabilize their shoulder. In young males who engage in physical activity, the redislocation rate is nearly 100% without surgery. Although recurrence rates are lower with physical therapy alone after a dislocation event, they are not as low as recurrence rate after combined shoulder stabilization and physical therapy together. Redislocation rates after stabilization may occur as frequently as 25% of the time. Finally, number 13, what do you do to avoid a shoulder dislocation? To minimize your chances of shoulder instability, there are several steps that you can take to avoid shoulder dislocation, or at least minimize your risk for this injury. You should work to maximize your flexibility, mobility, strength, and proprioception of the affected shoulder. First, you should work on developing a full passive range of motion of both shoulders that is symmetrical. This minimizes the chance of injury due to asymmetry between the sides. Second, you should work to develop strength throughout the available range of motion. This minimizes the chance of injury at parts of the range of motion where the muscle is mechanically disadvantaged, normally when it is very short or very long. Third, you should develop overall strength in the shoulders, arm, chest, and upper back to maximize your ability to withstand sudden external forces that might otherwise cause a dislocation or subluxation event. Fourth, you should routinely practice proprioception training to train your brain to recognize and be able to react to changing positions and movements that may lead to dislocation events, thereby decreasing the likelihood that they might occur. Finally, you should regularly train awkward positions in a controlled setting. This allows your body to have an established method for dealing with an awkward position before you find yourself in that position for real. 
You don't want the first time that your brain has to figure something out to be the time that it is actually happening for reals. Okay. For exercise tips, workouts, or exercise tutorials, you can check out our exercise channel on YouTube, Human 2.0. If you like this video, then subscribe to my channel and become a part of the intern army. Hit the notification bell so that you don't miss any of my weekly content. And be sure to share this with a medical student or someone who is interested in medical topics. And of course, don't forget to follow me on my socials. Thanks for watching. I will see you for rounds next week. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday or dull. Just a flesh wound.